I recently published the book Play to Potential, published by Penguin, where I share a framework flavor which we can use to lead a multidimensional life. As part of the book, I decided to profile six people who I believe are exemplars of playing to their full potential and leading a flavorful life. One of them is Sangeeta Shahani. Sangeeta's father was one of the pioneers in executive search in India. However, Sangeeta decides to start off as a homemaker for the first few years. She marries a sailor, decides to see the world and focus on her family and children. But due to an unfortunate health episode, she loses her husband. After that, she decides to take stock of life and sets up a small SAT coaching practice in Pune, which over the years has turned into a really flourishing business. Sangeeta's journey is a great case of not overcomplicating life, looking at reality in the eye, being pragmatic, and taking one baby step at a time, and really playing to your full potential. Without further ado, let's listen and learn from Sangeeta Shahani. Sangeeta, thank you so much for uh, making the time to come on uh, the Play to Potential podcast. Yeah, thank you for having me on. Uh, and as you know, in this uh, series of conversations, we are talking to people who I believe are striving to play to their full potential as a human being. And uh, clearly, uh, you're one of them, I believe, and uh, would love to understand the various dimensions of life uh, in this conversation, Sangeeta. But Maybe for the purpose of uh, listeners, uh, if you could just chat a little bit about who you are, you know, what do you do currently? Why do you do what you do? If you could just give us a sense of that, and then maybe we could pick it up from there. Okay, so um, if I talk about where I am today, I have a small company which I run, and my focus is to prepare students for a uh, standardized test called the SAT, uh, which students who are going to the US require for undergrad admissions. I have been uh, in this business since 2010. So I have a pretty vast knowledge of it and a you know, good grip on the understanding of what is needed. Um, because my um, overall perspective on how I wanted my life to be was never necessarily career driven mm. uh, the business part is just one aspect um, at this point in my life I am uh, at the stage where um, you know I'm pretty done with a lot of the big responsibilities when it comes to my family and so while I have the business pretty much running on autopilot um, I'm also looking to do different things um, thanks to COVID, there's this larger sense of urgency to do things uh, sooner rather than later, because I feel, you know, we all lost a couple of years there. And most of us who are in my age bracket feel it even more because, you know, it's like, okay, we have these many years to travel and, you know, do other things. And then we lost two years of that. So this is where I'm at. I... I am free to do what I wish. And with the business doing well uh, on its own, um, I'm lucky to be able to start thinking about pursuing other things also. Mm -hmm. And and when you say other things, are there a few thoughts emerging in your head just to explore those? Yeah. So uh, again, you know, uh, within my own um, plan for myself, I said, you know, I'm, I'm basically always, I've always been a planner. And, you know, when I was going through, uh, you know, the, what, what, a bit of what we were going to discuss, I started seeing this emerge mm -hmm. from a much earlier time. I mean, you don't think about it till mm. you kind of look back. And there's, there came a time where I said, okay, um, what would I want to do for the next so many years? And I put it down to, I want to learn something which will keep my mind extremely active and agile. I definitely want to travel and I want to have time to start uh, devoting myself to a few causes that matter to me. So an ideal day for me going forward would be something like 
you know, um, I would like to structure my week where I have these few causes where I would volunteer, give my time to or whatever's required. And not like a bunch of them, uh, you know, I've still got to decide two or three where I can really give my time to. Um, I would then also like to give some time to, uh, when I said, you know, something that keeps my mind agile, I started learning this game called Mahjong. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and How do you spell it? How do you spell it? M-A-H-J-O-N-G. Uh -huh. So okay. it's a very popular game uh, in China and Hong Kong. And, um, you know, you play it with tiles. Actually, my mother used to play it many, many years ago. And as a child, I would come home and watch her. Uh -huh. And it always fascinated me. But, you know, it wasn't something that was I, I was going to do at that point. And then I realized that there's a huge fraternity uh, who play this game in Pune. Wow. So I consciously, you know, wiggled my way in there and uh, started learning it. So you play for four hours at a stretch and there's different you know things you need to do so it just keeps you completely absorbed and sometimes you actually feel tired mentally when you you're done so a, a typical day a week would be portioned into playing my game uh, my volunteer work and continuing with my classes uh, you know in the some of the evenings mm. because now that i've moved everything online that's possible and of course, I would love to join a choir. Wow. <laughs> that, that so, sounds and, like and a listen, full life. Uh, in between that, of course, family. And I and my as my daughter says, she says, you know, I'm gonna start feeling like I need to take an appointment with you. <laughs> but the bottom line is they would come first. Of course, of course. And you have two children, did you say, Sangeeta? Yes, I have two children. Uh, my daughter is settled in Mumbai, uh, just had a baby. And my son is in London. He was working with Twitter and then jumped ship just before <laughs> the London office sank and he moved to Reddit. Um, I don't, I mean, he may uh, decide to move back and stuff, but I think for them, uh, they're also pretty clear that they're very happy to indulge the fact that this next decade is my time. Mm. So it's, you know, it's, it's like, be selfish, mom, just do whatever you want, you mm. know? Mm. So I'm not, you know, in the sense, I'm not going to be expected to jump around and be at everyone's kind of beck and call. Not that that's how I would view it. Mm. So, it, I mean, I really feel that this is the time where, which is what I said the first time, that I'm really <laughs> having a great time. Lovely, lovely. Now, this is wonderful, Sangeeta. Uh, maybe uh, it's a good time to go back. Uh, I find it helpful to understand how people are formed by the early years. So can you talk a little bit about your formative experiences, first 15, 20 years? You you did talk about your parents coming in from Pakistan to India and how some of that might have shaped you. Can you talk a little bit about how you were shaped in the first few years of your life? Yeah, so, um, I mean, they were both refugees and started from zero and, of course, came from wealthy families, you know. They're the typical story where they literally left everything and packed jewelry in these saris and, you know, at the station, worried about what would happen, pin drop silence when they crossed the border, you know, that kind of uh, thing. And both of them separately started off in, like, one-room homes, you know, and so, you know, while, I mean, I loved hearing all of this, um, I also understood that yet, you know, it's like, so our community, we're Sindhis, um, always believed in working hard and, you know, the whole business thing. So I saw that, I saw how for my father, it was education and hard work, you know, and he had this fire. He was an entrepreneur to his very core. And he always had this fire to do something. In fact, if I think about both my parents, I, on one, I had my dad, who was just like raring to go for everything. And on the other side, I had my mother, who was actually the nervous kind, you know. Uh, uh, unknown scared her. So she held him back a lot, like, he got, got the opportunity to maybe uh, settle abroad for some years, but she was too scared to leave her little 
cocoon of you know whatever they had created. When my brother got an opportunity uh, to go to United Wales College on a full scholarship, she just said, no, 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 it's not the age for it and didn't let him go. And even with me, it was, she didn't, she wanted to hold on to me and not necessarily let me go out to study, which was fine because I was also very attached to them, you know. So that combination, and she always told me, she says, you know, you may, I was a very shy kind of quiet kid. My brother was the extrovert. But she always told me, she said, you know, you're very quiet and things, but, you know, you, you're not phased by any of, you know, you're not like me. And somewhere I thought, you know, I shouldn't be like her because it's not to be afraid and all doesn't take you very far. And so there were situations where I would also, I would lie to her only to prevent her from preventing me. A small example is when I was doing my postgrad at the Tata Institute, um, twice a week we were allotted to different organizations for field work. Now, I had never taken local trains, buses, yes, but no local trains into suburbs and things like that. And this required it. Like if you were placed at uh, a factory, you would have to go to Thane, you know, on those two days. And at the start, you know, um, for the, just to find my feet, I needed to be dropped to, you know, Grand Road Station. And she kept saying, but, you know, where are you going? And, and I wouldn't tell her that I had to go to Thane because I said, she's probably going to yank me out of the program, you know, stuff like that. So there were many things that I just didn't tell her. And it's only later that she said, oh, my God, but you're right. I wouldn't have let you do any of this, you know. Mm, mm. So this uh, seeing her subconsciously made me probably uh, strong because I didn't want to be like that. But she was also a wonderful role model as a mom, mm. you know, the nurturing and the, you know, this thing about you always want, you look for your mom when you come home from school. Mm. So, mm. you know, it's, it's, it's in the early years where even as a child, you're not registering it. Mm. But somewhere I understood that, you know, this is how it should be. You know, you want your mom there and things like that. It was my father who actually saw the potential before I did. Mm. And, you know, right from even choice of, um, Hobbies, for example. Mm -hmm. My mom sang beautifully. My father loved Bharat Natyam. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then they said that, okay, we'll expose her to both and then let her choose. It so happened that, and my mom's, in retrospect, she was right because she said, you know, music can be with you forever because you don't need a, a setup for it, you know, and True. Uh, you can just sing it's but for dance yeah. yeah for dance you know if you don't have your music with you or the accompaniments and over time whatever so she would my father would accompany me to every class and sit through it because he loved it so much and because he wanted he didn't want the fact that I had to go on my own or anything mm. you know to come mm. in the way and so that's how I learned Bharatnatyam and then did Maharangitram and whatever. Wow. So that's and something very close to, as I mentioned the last time we spoke, my wife did her Arangitram in 40 and my kids, both my son and daughter learn Bharatnatyam. And, and yeah. music is very close, very close to our hearts as well. So you, you've touched yes. the nerve there. Yeah. So so what happened, uh, just to finish the Bharatnatyam story, is that um, my, I had a very young guru. Mm -hmm. In the sense, she was in her early 30s herself. Uh, and when she but she got married and she was moving to Canada, so she didn't want to shut her school down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So she asked a few of us who had done a Arangetram if we would like to uh, teach some of the junior mm. kids in the mm. same place. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we kind of, she divided the kids. And then, so every time from college, I would go there twice a week to take uh, classes with my student. And then my, my student did her Arangetram also. Wow. <laughs> but it was under her, you know, guys. So, of Fair course, enough. she came, used to come and brush her up and things like that. But the music, I did go back to it and I did start taking um, lessons and stuff. Uh, so, all I, what I, to come back to my parents, even though uh, it was so many, many years ago, they, they, they came with 
the, their approach to bringing us up was far more modern than mm. a lot of parents at that time. Mm. You know, mm. um, we were, uh, they put us into a co-ed school because they just said, which is the best school near where we are. Uh, they, even when it came to teenage issues and boyfriends and stuff, I could go and tell them anything, you know. There was no pressure later on to get married and whatever. It was the other way around where I was keen. <laughs> My dad said, okay, hmm. remember I told you, I said, I just yes. wanted to have this happy family and children. And he said, just go study, work, and that'll happen. Hmm. You know? hmm. So he was the one. And, and later, when I started working with him, because he had grown this business, which he and I kind of, he started it, but I worked with him right from day one. And he would always say that, you know, she has the potential to take it further if only mm. she wants to, mm. you know, <laughs> but I had other plans for myself. So yeah, let's talk about that, Sangeeta. I think uh, I uh, I found some of the choices interesting as well, right? You spoke about not choosing to get into the business that your father had set up. Then subsequently, you spoke about your involvement at Akanksha. And then subsequently, you spoke about how SAT coaching happened uh, more recently. Can you talk a little bit about maybe each of these transitions? But I guess the one thing I realize is sometimes the professional transitions are also in the context of a personal transition, right? So if you can talk a little bit about both the professional and personal as uh, as you sort of chart the timeline. So, so to begin with, uh, uh, you know, because I always, my goal, like I said, was the other one and not professional. Even mm. when I did my post-grad, I worked with my father right away. Although if, if, if career was the way to go, the smart thing would have been go out and work because, you know, there were campus interviews and things. Yes. And then go back because the business is not going anywhere, you know, because mm. you can add so much value. But for me, it was jump right in because I don't know how long I'm going to do this. Mm. Right. Mm. So... Again, from a practical perspective, yes, if I had met the right person in Mumbai, that would have been ideal. Hmm. Where, you know, you meet the right guy, he's in Bombay, you can carry on doing your thing and everything may have taken a different path altogether. But when a couple of relationships didn't work out and I realized that, you know, um, by restrict restricting myself, I might make the wrong choice. I then said to myself that, you know, I'm not going to do that because I really do want to move on with this phase in my life. So it was really thought through without really mm. thinking that I was thinking it through. You know, it's mm. like, mm. this is what I want. This is the thing that's most important to me. Okay, so things in Bombay didn't work out, but I'm not going to settle mm. for what I think is the most important relationship going forward. Because the business is so important to me. I understand. I understand. And yeah, and it so happened that the, my husband wasn't from Mumbai. And so, you know, that's how my life moved in the other direction. Hmm. And you said he had a traveling job, right? He was a, he was in the Merchant Navy, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, he was everything uh, my parents didn't think I would say yes to. <laughs> <laughs> because, um, you know, a Merchant Navy was always looked at oh you know he didn't want to study so he went to see kind of thing and my husband also apparently chose this because he did very well in the mid years of school and his father was so excited like he got a double promotion and stuff and the, the dad said listen my son is going to be this IIT engineer thing whereas if they had just let him be he would have gone into uh, he would have loved to do law and things like that, you know, mm, BA, mm. BA for boys, never, you know, in mm, those days. Mm, mm. So they kept pushing. And in rebellion, he just said, I'm out of here. Mm. Now, it's not that the exams to do uh, in the Merchant Navy are easy. So he said, mm. before I knew it, I was stuck with that, but my ego didn't allow me to quit. Mm -hmm. So, yes, so it literally went from... Uh, somebody not from Mumbai to somebody who's nowhere because after we got married, I sailed with him. Mm -hmm. 
and and even then you know my dad always uh, there was always a lot of because you know when he was like i said the pioneer of head hunting in india hmm so there was a lot of research also involved right because you wanted to see who's where and then you know and of create course. this whole database so i would take all that material with me because i had all the time to do it I understand and i would actually mail like physical you know in those days mail it to him from the different ports and stuff like that so life was like an adventure this was like a me. truly this was a truly work from anywhere concept way many years before way, covid happened <laughs> yeah and he was writing a book so then he would send me drafts you know so i was doing my thing but i was also having a great time because in those days you know one couldn't afford to try, see the world mm. and that's what we were doing mm. you know mm. so that's when i my life moved into the next phase which was settling down because once we started a family you know couldn't sail that much my husband quit and try to do commodities that didn't work out and then when he had to go back to sailing we moved to pune because we decided that if i have to raise my family for a chunk of time without him there then delhi was not i mean i never took to it and it's different when you know your husband's there and you have hmm. a circle and you have this thing but alone you know it's yep. different of course my mum in law was with me but whatever anyway so we moved here and then i was still not working um but at some point i started you know when my son second born started you know finding his feet and totally moving into the school system and stuff i realized that i had pockets of time hmm again because i was very clear that i did not want to um compromise on my family time at all i said i said to myself uh, okay you know so what do i do which doesn't make the demands of me you know when it comes to holidays and stuff because i want to do i want to be free for them when they're free so hmm. the summer the diwali the winter and stuff like that so obviously volunteering made sense hmm so in the early days i used to just go to this orphanage uh, which was not far from me but i found that that was a very loose kind of thing you know like i just go and help them out and that was it then i said okay why not uh, go to a place which has some structure so that whatever i'm doing also has some impact because i was very clear that i was not going to be the kind of volunteer who said oh i need to go out for lunch today so i'm not going to mm. lunch mm-hmm. you know i was i al- always had i mean once you worked like i worked for 6 years at akansha I, no uh, before at boyden before i moved Understood. to akansha uh, and then of course there was a gap but you know when you've worked uh, and you've kind of got that discipline i could never lose that discipline mm which means that like even when i was just at home you know it's like i could never uh, watch a movie with friends at 11 in the afternoon on a weekday i just couldn't mm. you know i'd just be busy with stuff but i would you know you know what i mean i, I couldn't you. just mm. there's a certain work ethic that comes in yeah mm. Mm. which i which is not judging anyone else but that's just how i was so when i actually walked into akansha i think they didn't know how serious i'd be but they needed the volunteers obviously and so the uh, but then you know i proved to them that i'm going to be here every monday wednesday friday and i would go in when they open which would be maybe 9:30 10 but i would leave and be in time for when my son he i would literally come home and he would be at the door hmm. you know because hmm. of school timings and that went on for 5 years and it would have probably continued forever mhm It, uh, if my husband hadn't passed away mm. because um i was pretty much a part of the company i was included in everything they had printed uh my own i had my own visiting card if i had to meet a potential person they would say the our hr person only comes on these days you know it mm. wasn't just okay and and i was also getting involved in other things mm. with them and as i said last time uh in 2009 they were moving out of uh so earlier they would target these uh, different bastis and have hmm. these centers 
where ch- ki- uh, every evening student uh, kids would come in and they would teach them spoken english but there also they were getting frustrated because you know they couldn't uh, map the progress that well so you're putting in all that energy and you're getting training teachers but what's happening to these kids especially if suddenly the husband uh, loses the job and they go off somewhere then what happens to all those mm. years Hmm. so they were working on moving into municipal schools and then making an impact from like zero upwards hmm so they were moving into a very exciting phase and i was i had already planned my role uh, after the summer of 2009 you know when my husband's cancer diagnosis diagnosis happened so uh all that happened during the summer in fact which year which year was this if i may ask uh, 2009 it was mm-hmm. uh may of 2009 so six mm-hmm. years of boyden then there was an interval and then i worked for five years with akansha mm-hmm. so well, the reason i ask is 2008 is when my dad was diagnosed with uh, stage 4 colon cancer and in a way that phase for me is just about dealing with his cancer treatment and just uh, you know uh, that that sort of the when i think of 2008 that sort of the yes. defining memory so yes uh, yes i hear you okay okay so um that's that period from me till june uh, six weeks was pretty much what was from finding mm. out to when he passed mm. and my daughter was just going into the 11th my son was going into the 8th mm ninth tenth i think ninth i don't remember but mm. so i just remember uh, i mean sort of saying okay i need to step so so you know what happens when you're in that situation uh it's it's almost surreal you know because you're saying like what happened to our lives you know <laughs> literally mm. but i knew that i just had to prioritize this Hmm. In the background I could tell that everyone was going haywire my mom in law was having ha- trying to handle it her way and we had gone to Bombay for the treatment so hmm. they are here she is trying to hold fort as well as obviously deal with her own anxiety my daughter was going completely hmm. you know handling it like don't not wanting to deal my son was hmm. completely shattered but i i somewhere i told myself that i cannot deal with those things mm, mm. there's enough time to pick those little pieces up you know focus on this for the mm, moment mm. so when i when i did when things kind of settled um for a period of time i just mm. got my breath and basically you just want to hang on to the kids and yep. you know sort of navigate this whole new normal or whatever and as i said last time literally i mean i remember this conversation so obviously you know because my husband was in the hospital for a length of time and mm. uh, so you know family would and being cancer you you, you can't have guests and stuff dropping in so they would sort of keep an eye on me for when the time when i wasn't with him in the hospital so every now and then my, my brother would they take me to the club and say you know let's have a quick bite you know change of scene and all that and that's when he started talking about this lady who was doing the sat in mumbai this was your husband talking about it or was it my the... brother dinesh dinesh of course got it got it so he started telling me about this this i uh, we spoke about it last time you know this yes, counselor yes, yes, viral yes, doshi yes, yes. and how, how he was recommending another batchmate who used to teach english in school mm. and he said what are you doing there you know if you start doing the sad i can send students to you and mm. you know why do you want to just be stuck in a job and he just said you know it's english and you've always loved the language and stuff like that and you know i was just i was it was just somewhere in the periphery of my head at that time and when i came back after everything i remember thinking and i think i told you that there were times when i couldn't do things that my husband and i did together so it's like if we have we always had tea and read the paper together so i couldn't read the paper 
for a while. Mm. And yet with my tea, I needed to read something which, so then I said, yeah, you know, he was talking about the SATs. Let me, so a friend of mine's son had just given the test. So I mm. said, let me call for the books. So I literally started looking at these dog-eared books at that time. Okay, you know, just, you know, you want to um, move your mind into something that's so different that it mm. doesn't focus. You know what I mean? Mm. So I was doing that. Then, and so I could say that I was fortunate uh, because uh, financially we weren't that badly off. But obviously, you know, I mean, I had a long way to go. My kids hadn't even started their careers and marriage and everything to go. So I knew that I have to think of something to do that would also, uh, you know, bring in some money. Uh, but there was no, it's not that I had to do it tomorrow. Hmm. Hmm. So, you know, so I could take my time and think about it. So I said, all right, what's the next step I should do? And then I said, I don't know anything about teaching the SAT. What if I somehow find a job for six, eight months where in a, one of these institutes that do that? Hmm. And there was this the Lip Oaks Academy, which advertises for GMAT, GRE and all that stuff. And it said sad. So I said, okay, let me go and see what it's all about. But of course, he put me in this other department, which was editing essays and stuff. And they basically didn't have the sad. They were just saying they did, which I realized. Mm -hmm. He kept saying, we'll do it. But I realized, so I said, okay, let me, you know, work for a little bit. But that lasted just about five, six months. Mm -hmm. And... During the course of that time, um, a friend of mine uh, was also looking to do something as her kids were moving out of the house. And she was a teacher before. Mm -hmm. So we used to talk and she said, you know, um, and I said that, you know, my brothers told me about this. And she said, oh, what a great idea. And <clears throat> we started with, we said, okay, you know, let's think about it. So we started brainstorming and things like that. And then... So she helped put the structure into place about the class and how many we'd need, blah, blah, blah. And I started telling her that, you know, we need to go out and how do we get business, right? Mm -hmm. So that's when we said, okay, we should have to start by making presentations in different schools. So we started calling and making appointments and it wasn't that easy, but because both our sons were from the same school, they gave us the time of day. And that's how we got our first students. Wow. But wow. even then, you know, Deepak, mm. I, so then uh, in a few years, so we literally operated from home. And this okay? is just to understand timelines. So we, which year are we talking about now? So 2010 you... is when I 10. started. Okay. Okay. And it's just when uh, we were not, so again, because I'm my father's daughter, I was dreaming of making it a big thing. She <clears throat> was not. So she thought, you know, in the house, tuitions kind of set up. So I was the one who kept pushing, you know, that kind of stuff. So it was literally uh, two students and we didn't think of marketing. We didn't think of anything because we also wanted to test our, of course. Uh, our of module course. and everything like that. So it so happened that the next batch coincided with her son's batchmates who mm, needed mm, it. Mm. And the mom, and there weren't, uh, there, there, see, there were two or three um, in, uh, institutes that did the SATs, but these were, um, you know, like franchises. So they were very rigid. They were tied down by the franchise, you know, so yeah. they weren't flexible. And there was one other person doing the SAT at that time. In Pune. Hmm. Yes. So hmm. there was school. <clears throat> so so he, her her son's batchmates, so suddenly there were a group of eight. And then word started spreading. It was only word of mouth from our homes. Wow. At some point, we realized, okay, let's now take a small space down the road because, you know, it's kind of coming in the way of day-to-day -day life. So we then moved to a small uh, office, not very far from where we are, but we are in one end of Are you familiar with Pune? Not very, not very. Okay. 
So it's like, uh, you know, if you look at Bombay, you know, it's like, suppose you're in South Bombay or how do you tap into kids in the North, you know, that kind of stuff. So we are located uh, in one of the suburbs before you hit the highway and move on Mm -hmm. to the Bombay Puna thing. Mm -hmm. Um, So at that time, again, through word of mouth, uh, we started getting a trickle of students. Uh, and we were getting students from the other side too, because, you know, if they're going to the same school, then mothers would talk. At some point, my friend decided to, that, I mean, her husband decided to take up a job in Dubai. So then mm. she moved out of the picture. And I realized that, you know, I have this office in down the road, but I need to have an office one more, uh, one mm. more center on the other side to capture that entire gang. Because I started realizing that parents were finding it hard to send them all across because of the traffic and the city going, growing and, you know, all that stuff. So that's when I said, all right, I'm, I can't handle two and home because my kids were home. My mom-in-law was with me. So I said, let me move the office close by back into the house. And have the other one that side. So I'm at least when I'm teaching from home, I'm still there, right? To keep an eye on things. And I live in a bungalow, so I could isolate a small area and they wouldn't come into the house, you know? So it was Mm. private. So that worked fine. And then I had uh, this other center in town. Mm. Still no presence on the internet, okay? Um, You know, because I, I was not at that time thinking of expanding and doing any of that especially when my partner left because then it, we had thought of moving into counseling and stuff but when she left I was saying okay let me just get hmm. a handle on this hmm. first hmm. so so then um, it was like home and that and one place there then I got a teacher on board so she took the load of me commuting there too much in 2016 the SAT changed its format so Till 2016, the format was uh, 30, uh, two thirds was English based and one third was math. Mm-hmm. So the one third math, the students could manage because invariably they had math tutors from their 10th grade and or I had a, a kind of a panel of maths teachers, I would refer to them. In 2016, when they changed the format to 50-50, 50% of English and math, I was then approached by uh, a teacher who I had started referring because I got good feedback about his work. And he said, you know, can we work together? Hmm. You know? So when we decided to do that, uh, while for a period of time, he used to come here as well as the other place. Then I said, okay, now it's time to move out of the house. Hmm. So then again, we moved to a small location, not far from my house because it, this, Location is very good to tap into a whole bunch of, uh, sub, you know, small pockets here. And so so then, you know, it became easier for me because he took the load off a lot of the little things and things like that. Of and um, we, so then again, it's like, okay, I told myself we shouldn't be renting an entire space. So I approached a school like, you know, and we got just a classroom you know, which they dedicated to us in the sense we had our furniture and stuff. So, you know, that way, even though it was shut, because, you know, my classes were mainly in the evenings. Hmm. So, you know, I'm not paying rent and having this whole space locked up. Um, We would just pay rent for that one room and use it as we wished. We still have that location even now. Um, And, and, you know, so so that's how we kind of expanded. And I think it was, again, word of mouth. Of course, somewhere along the way, I then created a website and things. But I think just the fact that we delivered quality and and also, um, you know, if there was an issue and the student changed his mind, I mean, we would, we didn't have a thing about partially refunding fees. You know, it was really not about hmm. just grab, you know, so somehow parents felt good about the way we ran things and the results were there of course Mm. always the main thing so again as time passed we started looking to see if we could 
again work with a counselor, set up this, uh, you know, an, a proper uh, organization and then maybe get bought out or something. Mm -hmm. But the reason why we didn't go down that path is because over the last few years, there's a very active conversation in uh, the US uh, college circles about the relevance of the SATs. Hmm. So what started happening was, it's always been a conversation because uh, the, the, the mm, people against standardized testing say that if you come from an affluent family, you can afford the best tutors. Mm -hmm. So your children automatically do better in the SAT and so they get into colleges, blah, blah, blah. And what about the others, right? So there's always been this tussle should they be having the SAT as a, as a standardized test or not? Um, it's been there for a while, <clears throat> but COVID uh, changed things because what happened with COVID, uh, this was a pencil paper test. Hmm. So students have to go to a center. They couldn't hold the SAT for almost one and a half years. So they had to start doing admissions without using the SAT. Mm -hmm. And that gave that whole uh, bunch of group of people the strength to really move that forward and say, well, you've taken students in, you've not, you, you know, you've done well enough. So why do you want to reinstall it? Mm -hmm. So when all that happened, I told myself, I said, look, I have, this has served its purpose for me, served it and much more not only from the financial side, but I just interacting with students of that age, I just love it, you know? So I would love taking my classes. And of course, the financial angle was, was wonderful. It really, you know, uh, helped me to uh, plan everything in a way that I could meet all my responsibilities, which included sending my son. I would have sent both of them out but my daughter decided to be a singer. So she went down another path. But my son um, went out to study. And then, you know, all the big things that as parents, you, my daughter got married. I was able to give her the kind of wedding she wanted and, you know, things like that. So I told myself, I said, okay, so this debate is always going to happen. Why am I looking to expand and stuff? And then in the next year, be told where no colleges want the mm. sad and then I'm mm. sort of you know why don't I just enjoy it while it lasts because see Indian now there are a bunch of colleges that say we are test optional mm. so Indian parents when they hear test optional they still want their kid to do it because you know so we still I mean uh, it's not that business has dropped but it hasn't grown the way it was growing Understand, and the winds but are probably blowing in a different direction when you take a five-year view or a ten-year view. And, exactly. Uh, what I what I find fascinating is sort of the, if I may, attachment yet detachment with the business. Right? Uh, there's a, I mean, clearly I see, I see you saying that uh, you love you love this financials are nice. Uh, you enjoy teaching kids, but at the same time, I hear you being uh, dispassionate about it. I, I think one of the themes I'm curious about. Uh, Sangeeta is also how the um, how the shape of aspiration shifts over time, right? I think, uh, and I say aspiration instead of ambition because ambition often is sort of along one dimension that I want to build a unicorn, I want to be an MD, I want to be a partner. But aspiration can be about the various dimensions of life. So can you talk a little bit about maybe the different phases and how the aspiration has shifted over time? Let's say maybe when you were married, uh, maybe pre-marriage, around marriage, maybe uh, the last few years i'd love i'd love to understand and and what where it stands today yeah so when i'm saying that you know i always wanted to get married i i still i did want when i was in my early 20s i wanted to be that career person hmm. in bombay and all that and i was yes. you know I, yes. I ended up doing just that i had 6 years of that so it kind of yes. you know i enjoyed that phase but like i said i i then somewhere in my mind i said okay it's, it's, you know, I do want my family and stuff. So then I moved into that phase. But I also said, I, I, this is not just what I want to do. I need mm. to be engaged and I need to be meeting people and I need to be, you know, out there. But 
keeping my um not compromising on the quality of time i have with my kids hmm. so that's when the akanksha thing happened and i was pretty happy to you know let my husband like uh own and uh, and me not own because you know i i never had issues about that hmm. at that time at that time because i knew that this was not the time for that the minute i i would take on something which i would do and i would charge for it or i would apply for a job then the pressure start building hmm and i did not want to be deviated from the core idea that i needed to be there for my children hmm and i have always felt this and i felt it again when my uh, granddaughter was born you know it's it's like you can shape another person and of course if you're lucky you have to be lucky that you don't have to work right so if you and of course if two uh, both partners work you can have all the material things so that's a different thing i just always felt the weight of that hmm hmm and i again felt it when my daughters had this baby and i'm saying oh my god i mean you know we can do so much good or bad and set this person free into the world you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. true so so that's why in those days that's what i wanted i was very clear that i don't want anything which forces me to get that pressure because i'm being paid or if i'm setting up something when my husband passed and not to say that i may not have done something you know later while he was still there hmm. it could have happened but i don't know because i was really enjoying my time at akanksha but maybe i would have got into something uh, a paid uh, position hmm. with them i don't know hmm. so the next phase is also um started of maybe as some kind of need i don't uh, you know and and then the business now i did want to grow it it's not that i was saying okay you know let it just be so i was you know uh communicating with different people i was doing everything to build it but uh again in a manageable way hmm. Hmm. okay so like wherever i saw an opportunity i was addressing schools or whatever i did presentations with uh i i get students even from abroad and stuff so you know if there was an opportunity to talk to a bunch of parents so i was doing all that i did want to grow the business and it so the timing also worked because you know my kids were older and moving mm. down their own paths and and it's only that when i then took stock of things uh to okay now what should we take it one step further and then you know build this entire thing where you provide like all the services under one roof mm. you know for mm. and then i said but you know if the sap could like just at the drop mm. of a hat at someone else's decision it's gone then you know what are we putting all that in for mm. and mm. i'm also at that stage in my life where you know i don't need to move this further if you know if uh, i don't have to so when mm. that happened i said okay let me just carry on with it and i do i mean it's not that i'm not putting in all the effort because you know you have to um, move, you know you have to the material changes and you want to you know so it's all happening but the thing of taking it to the next level i decided to not do that understood i think the other piece uh, sangeeta which which comes through very clearly is just uh, a level of self awareness right i think i do genuinely believe as life unfolds both on the personal and professional front that there are just so many choices that come up do i double down do i expand do i take this job do i stay at home do i focus on the kids etc etc can you talk a little bit about what's been that for you how have you Uh, what's been your mechanism of building your internal awareness over time uh you know i always uh had i feel i've always had this um you know how you have a very strong intuition hmm that's always been there you know i've i've i 
uh, it's some like my gut feel about things is strong. So that's one part. Also, I I feel that you know, um, how would I put it? I just react to a situation in the moment hmm. and then decide that okay this is what needs to be done this is what after and sometimes it's an emotional situation so i just say okay hang on you know and i, I if i look at how i've handled things mm-hmm. you know i i will say okay what do i need to do now you know and then say okay this is what i need to do hmm. what do i want to do and what do i need to do hmm. and hmm. how do i kind of merge the two you know hmm. and that's why this thing about i want to build my thing but i need to be home so hmm. how do i do you know so okay so then i'm not going to go out and expand and have five offices all over the place i will obviously lose students but no this is what i need to do now you know interesting um i want to expand it but you know when i'm doing the math and if all this this thing then what's the right way to do it so you know you hmm. you kind of uh balance that out and also you know um this thing about okay this has happened just put your head down and get on with the job hmm. is, is a bit like you know um as i said you know from all the emotional roller coasters i think accepting first of all accepting what's happening in your life is the big one when i think back about how i've you know moved ahead with all this i think you need to accept and say okay this has happened hopefully i did my best what do i do now hmm you know but if you always say oh my god i that happened and if that had happened and why didn't that happen and if i had done that differently it's not happening hmm those are rabbit holes you do not come out of hmm. you know so hmm. you you got to say okay like even when you know when the thing about the sad started i said so i said oh my god i've just built this and now you know it's all so it's okay what would i do you know i did even ex- think about okay what my next thing could have been you know just moving into editing essays and things so hmm. you know i had thought of different things Hmm. but but the thing is to i think that for me i seem to have this balance of uh, practical hmm i'm very emotional but somewhere i can take stock and say okay but this is what i need to do you know what i also love uh, in the journey sangeeta is just a, there's a certain organicness to it right it's not yes. no sharp turns it's a bit like <laughs> a, to, to go back to go back to shipping right a ship can turn only slowly you can't take a u turn yes. like a cycle yes. so even when i look at some of your choices it's never been it's been slow but steady and uh, it's almost like uh, you just keep Flowing. marching you just keep yeah. marching and uh, so, stuff happens so that's what i mean by literally putting your head down and saying this is what i need to do so mm. you're getting on with it so you know it's like that's why when shweta told me that you know you have a story i said really i thought i've just been going mm. about my stuff you know mm. i needed to do this at this time now when i'm thinking back you know mm. of course it's like the whole flow uh, you know for right from an early age my parents gave me a lot of confidence you know we i'll give you a small incident so i, I was thinking about it so uh what i was saying was uh in my early grow- uh, years uh we always had these relatives coming and staying and stuff and you always have these annoying aunties masses around and for some reason one of them had great pleasure in take me aside every now and then and saying do you know uh dinesh was is their son but you were adopted and i wouldn't kind of necessarily break down and you know but i think it happened one too often and you know sometimes you're just having a bad day and then i went to my mom and said you know this is what she's saying and stuff and she just told me she said you know you've always been told that you are a carbon copy of your dad so mm. just ignore her so and i know that that didn't ever impact me in a bad mm. way and i think that's also because of we we were as a family hmm another thing is you know uh, deepak it's like 
you know, when you are in an audience and they say, okay, we are doing a lucky draw and you're going to win tickets to Hong Kong. I always believe I'm going to win it. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I've never won it, but it's like, oh my God, I'm going to win this, you know? And then, okay, I did. So it's just the way I, I am also, mm, you know? Mm, <laughs> so, mm. The the other piece I wanted to explore, Sangeeta, in this conversation uh, is, you know, very often, you know, in the context of Ikigai, people talk about purpose and my why, etc. But in my conversations with people, I find that purpose often emerges when you walk a certain path. Sometimes it's about just doing the day-to-day, -day, doing the small things. And then when you look back over a 10-year period, 20-year period, you know, you say, okay, maybe you know, this is how I see my purpose. Uh, it often reveals itself as you walk a path. What's been your experience with that as you've gone through the different phases of life? Uh, yeah, so like, I, like you know, I, in terms of what is my purpose on earth? Or... I think just, a, yeah, what, uh, you touched upon it in different ways, right? What, uh, what I need to do versus what I want to do. Clearly at that time, there's the, you know, the purpose of being a mother, being the primary purpose. Then there's a phase where uh, building the business probably becomes the purpose. Maybe educating kids and giving them a future becomes a purpose. So I'm just curious about how you've gone about, uh, again, uh, what's been your experience with it? Is that something that you've been deliberate about? You started the conversation by saying you're a planner. Or is that something that's emerged? You focused on the actions and then the purpose reveals itself when you when you look back over time. Yeah, so I think, you know, uh, I focus, so my thing has been that, okay, this is where I am, and mm. this is what I want to do. Now, things can take a different course, like they did, mm. and it mm. happens in everyone's life. And then you kind of deal deal with the situation. And then you say, okay, now, now, what do we do next? You mm. know, mm. and and so that's how always how it's been, like, say, today, I'm at the phase in one, my life where I have no responsibilities when it comes to the older generation. So, you know, I feel that my life is taking on a different purpose and I'm uh, like, you know, this, and, and then I'm kind of charting that in some mm. way, you know, mm. where I'm saying, okay, um, like I said, I need to do something that, so my mind is always active. I can, I keep my work going. I want to move into uh, some kind of um, social uh, mm. contribution. So for that, I've I've been I've started working with the Jehan School Trust, and mm. you know I'm a part of the trustees. But that's one. But my goal would be to build that a little mm. more, mm. and then my music. So I'm at a different stage in my life mm. where mm. my purpose is it's selfish right now. You know, it's it's about okay, like. What do I need to do? But I'm also conscious. So like, okay, I, I need to make sure that I'm healthy, mm. right? So for that, for example, while I've always exercised and, you know, things like that, I, I realized that I might need some extra help. So I signed on for some classes, which, which would preempt potential problems, like, mm. you know. Mm. So it's like, okay, you know, at a certain age, you, you could have knee issues, you could have this issue, mobility. So what do I need to do now? Mm. So I'm kind of learning how to uh, do certain exercise in a way that that's not going to happen. So that's Understood. the planner in me. You know? Understood. And clearly all of us uh, are going to give uh, live long lives, right? Unless there are unforeseen events. In general, given the advances in medical history, uh, uh, I, I think one of the themes I discuss as well is how do you really invest in yourself, right? Whether it's capabilities, whether it's mental health, whether it's physical health. Uh, I mean, the other the other theme I'm curious about is relationships. I find that people that thrive often have uh, relationships as one of the other pillars that they're very deliberate about. You know, uh, yes. can you talk a little bit about that? How that's how that's evolved over time in terms of uh, relationships? Uh, clearly, family has been one clear pillar. Uh, if you want to talk a little bit about relationships on the in a friend in terms of friends, in terms of let's hmm. say the other communities you belong to. So, so, um, so I'm a Scorpio, and I think I'm a typical Scorpio, which means that uh, when I'm a friend, I'm extremely loyal. Uh, you can trust me and stuff. And if things start going downhill, where uh, I feel that you know I'm betrayed uh, after giving my friend enough leeway, and 
you know, benefit of doubt, then I kind of just start moving away, you know? Mm, mm. So, so even with family, so, you know, you, there are ish, things that go on in families too, but for me, it's always important. I do like to come forward and, you know, try and sort things out. I don't like to have all that stuff hanging, you know, someone's upset and I've said this and all that stuff. Mm. So I have consciously made it, it important to keep relationships uh, re with close family intact. I've built good friendships over the years, which actually saw me through that worst period of my life. Um, you know, so I feel that that, that really, I mean, like this cliche of friends are often more than family. So, you know, I, I it's important, you know, and again, when it comes to cousins and stuff, so we now have a, a group where we make it a point to travel together once a year. Mm -hmm. So this is, you know, from my father's side and people, friends around look and say, oh my God, you know, we don't have this kind of thing, but mm -hmm. we've made it a conscious effort so mm -hmm. that we all touch base and, you know, we share uh, so many things about the past that the younger cousins mm. don't remember. So we've started and This is doing... with kids? So you do that with kids? No. And the... Okay. No, no, no. So this okay. is, everyone's done with the kids. <laughs> they can do their thing. So it's, it, it's like once a year, we have to travel together. So that's the cousins who are in touch. And mm. then they, it just, they become a different support system, you know? Mm. So mm. now again, to get back to this whole Mahjong that I started, that again opened up an entire fraternity of mm. people. And I start, I never thought, you know, you at a certain stage, you say, you know, I have my old friends and, mm. you know, I'll make, I, I can con converse with people at a party, but these are my old friends. But I've suddenly uh, found that in the last couple of years, which is when I started learning the game, I started building uh, close friendships with some. Mm. Uh, which again has added that extra dimension and it's, you know, uh, added mm. uh, a lot of fun to the whole thing. Mm. So that opened a different door, you know. And mm. then I still have, I mean, we have a great alumni. So we, again, try and meet twice a year and uh, get together in small groups. So I have a wonderful alumni mm. of my batch, you know. So, so, you know, relationships are very important to me mm. you know it, mm. it, if if i know that i've consciously you know hurt someone i would it would bother me mm -hmm. you know and it so, takes effort as you rightly say it takes a work it takes effort to to keep them active to keep them alive and to keep them thriving uh, whichever yes. community whether it's the alumni community or the friends or the relatives or the if i may say the interest based communities my, my wife for example currently she as I said, she and the kids pursue Bharatanatyam and she's found herself a group of young uh, women who are similar at a similar phase of life uh, who enjoy doing something together. So I guess it's sort of the joint the joint pursuit of something that you enjoy, which, which yes. brings you much closer. Uh, uh, so true. So true. I think the other so, thread I noticed, sorry, please. So I'm also thinking about, uh, so, so see, the, like people ask me that, you know, you never thought of getting married and stuff like that, you know, like, and I mm. never did because I just was so busy with getting my act together and, you know, all of that. And, and also, I think, you know, um, women in my situation look for a partner for different reasons. Sometimes it could be because they really need the financial support, mm. which mm. luckily I didn't. Uh, and then I don't think, you know, as, when it comes to your own children, nobody but a spouse can help you with that, you know? Mm. So I, I just felt that, you know, I don't, I literally don't miss having a partner except for when I want to travel <laughs> mm. <laughs> because suddenly, oh, so-and-so can't come and so-and-so can't come. And so, you know, it's like, oh my God, if I had my own uh, companion or something, then I don't need that. But then mm. now I said, okay, what do we need to do about that? So there are a lot of these women's groups that travel, mm. women only. So I said, okay, that option's there too. Uh, you know, so it's not that you can't um, figure things out mm. Mm. as you go, you know. Remarkable. I think uh, 
I think the other theme I pick up is just the curiosity, right? For example, you spoke about picking up this new game, Ma Ma Mahjong. Mahjong. <laughs> Mahjong. You should look it up. I will. <laughs> It sounds like Go, the, the Chinese game Go that people talk about. I wonder if it's similar to that, but uh, it seems like one it's of It's an ancient, games. ancient game, okay? If okay. you go, they, they gamble on the streets of China and Hong Kong. Wow, wow. Yeah. The point I was making was clearly there seems to be an element of curiosity as well, right? If you go back to you sipping your cup of tea with the SATs or learning Mahjong, clearly I think there's, I mean, the other theme I'm, I'm sort of learning about living a healthy life is just being curious, and picking up mm -hmm. new things uh, as you sort of go through different things, right? You're never done, right? There's always something new to pick up. Yes. Uh, and sort of, uh, you build a new community, you learn new things. You Yeah, that was the bonus. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So mm. it's, and another thing that I've, like, uh, I, I never called myself a religious person. Mm. Um, uh, but, and I never thought, you know, that I needed to be one, but I would do all the things that one does, you know, mm. on certain things. But suddenly I feel that, you know, uh, there's something there that's missing. Mm -hmm. I don't know what, what uh, it's still not, it's something that's swirling somewhere in my head where I feel that, you know, um, but I need to feel something mm -hmm. and then be drawn towards that. I don't know what it is, but if I had to look at the different things that I want to do, I feel that that is an area that I, it could be meditation. It could be something which I think I need to work on somewhere. It's just mm. this thing that's sort of forming. Mm. <laughs> mm. I think just, uh, uh, you know, I was ref I was reflecting on our earlier conversation as we were sort of preparing for this one. And you mentioned you, you lost, uh, uh, you lost a, a loved one recently, right? I think mom or mom in law, mom. I forget. Mom. mom. And, and I remember you saying vividly that, uh, but I'm having the time of my life, you know, and I was sort of, uh, I was struck by that uh, sort of that statement. It, it sort of suggests a certain inner, uh, inner calm, inner resilience, and inner peace. positivity, inner peace. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yes, absolutely. So the thing here is, you know, um, mom and I had, I mean, our relationship was different, okay? So she would tell me things like, why don't we have everyone over and I'll be in the other room and let them talk about me so that I know what they're going to say after. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say, and then I'd say, listen, you will probably be hovering around listening. So stop it. We are not going to do that. So, you know, we had, and my own daughter would be aghast. She said, what sort of humor is this? You know, <laughs> and, or she'd tell me that, you know, you know, she'd tell me, <laughs> she'd say things like, you know, I know that uh, at the end, you know, you can't have your dentures on. Please put my dentures on. I can't look so bad, <laughs> you know, to that. So, so she lived a beautiful life. She, and I think that I looked after her to the best of my ability. I think I gave her the kind of life I wanted to, you know. Mm. She was waited on hand and foot. She, uh, you know, garden, sitting in the sun, everything. Um, I was always, I had this worry always that how will the end happen, which tends to be something we think of as our parents get older. I would, wor I would take very short trips because I was blessed with a very good uh, infrastructure at home mm -hmm. so I could leave her and she would very cheerily wave me goodbye you know like because my mom was always like she just to the extent that if my daughter said anything about me she'd say don't say that she's my daughter you know like mm -hmm. no one could say anything about me so I just worried that I wouldn't be there when she passed away I worried that she, she said I don't want to go to the hospital ever and I and I worried that, you know, it would be a bad, you know, like suffering. When it happened the way it did, which was none of that, I was right there. You know, she was, she just had a small, uh, like she was sort of a little hallucinating. And then within a few hours, that was it, few deep breaths and she was gone. I did miss her, but I just felt this immense relief. 
not relief that I didn't have a because I didn't feel that she was a responsibility. Mm. Okay. Just relief that it all happened so beautifully. Mm. And that was what helped me to, and you know, even with my husband, because we did the best we could, that helped me to, not to think of, oh my God, what if? You know, your mind is like a monkey, you know, you let it jump, you need to just clamp it down and say, hmm. I'm not going there. So it's like that, you know, with her, I said, it could not have been better so you then accept it and then you, and then suddenly I said, but I'm also now free to do, you know, anything I want. And that's when I said, okay, now what do I need to do when I started enjoying mm. it myself? Mm. Got it. <laughs> so, you know, this series of conversations is about people who are striving to play to their full potential, right? Uh, across the various dimensions of life. You know, uh, if you were to reflect on your life and be modest, uh, you know, what are the couple of things that come to mind that you want to leave uh, the listeners with, uh, given your, the way you've experienced life? Uh, what would you say to play to full potential? What are the two, three, uh, maybe themes you want to leave us with? So I think, um, you know, it's like you have to work hard. You know, you have to have clarity, I think, you know, because if you don't have clarity, uh, you know, about where you want to go, then you're kind of stuck at that point till you get that clarity. And while, you know, I never knew the potential I had, you know, um, you everyone has that. It's just mm. that you need to believe in that and you need to have be focused on it mm. like now i'm just focused on being happy <laughs> so i am you know so so but you need to um i think i think that you there is an element of mental stability and strength mm. so you know if you if your goal is um not unreasonable uh, given, you know, the the environment in which you want to achieve it, you know, uh, I don't see why it can't happen. And you have to keep reinventing yourself as you go. You know, mm -hmm. you have to be able to let go of, you can't be attached to maybe your origin, where you started from and say, but that was where I wanted to go. Mm -hmm. You need to kind of go with the be flow forward. to a large mm -hmm. extent, you know, and mm -hmm. I think that that's how, I would say, as you said, that's how it's not that, you know, I just let things happen, but when things happened, I kind of took stock of them and said, you know, okay, that's, uh, it's like people would uh, recognize me uh, for my work, but I never thought of it as, oh, I want to be known as somebody, mm. you know, I just wanted mm. to do good work and mm. and that kind of stuff. So, I think you, uh, uh, you know, potential takes care of itself if you just let it move in a certain direction, but constantly, you know, have those checks and balances hmm. somewhere, hmm. Uh, which which you can sort of pull back and, you know, change the flow of how things hmm. are going hmm. on a regular basis. Possibly, I would say that that would be the way I could describe how, you know, I've reached you know, where I have. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense. No, but... no, I think uh, what, what's beautiful is each uh, each person defines it their own way, right? What I've, what I've come to realize is there are different ways to uh, live, a, live a full life. And I love what you said. I think one piece is just coherence to say, okay, this phase, I want to be happy and really focusing on that. The other phase is, okay, I want to be a responsible mother or a loving mother and being focused on that. The other is, I want to sort of really work and make a difference to people outside. So I think the other piece I realize is as we go through the different seasons, even the flavor of our life evolves. And I love the combination of planning and uh, sort of in a way being deliberate about it, but at the same time being responsive and being flexible and taking stock and not being fixated, being a little fluid to yeah. let things evolve. So 
Come yeah, on. I think that that is the only way because then mm. if that holds you back. Hmm. Hmm. Wonderful, Sangeeta. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time and uh, really inspiring how simple sounding you make it. But I'm sure, uh, you know, all of this requires a certain mindset and a certain perseverance and a certain uh, discipline to sort of do this over uh, many years. So thank you for making the time.